Hey everyone, it's Darwin here. I'm going to talk about uh, slicing and dicing with PowerShell on GitLab CI. I want to send a shout out and a thank you to at uh, Tonka Underbar 2000 on Twitter who called out to GitLab and said, hey, I'm having a hard time finding some PowerShell examples for GitLab CI. Could you, could you spare a few? So this uh, presentation has come about because of that. I want to take a look first in some slides at some of the architectural things that we'll be looking at, and then we'll dive right into the code and look at both the code and the results it generates. So one of the first ways that you can get your access to PowerShell and GitLab CI is through GitLab shared runners. And everything that we'll be talking about here is GitLab.com shared runners. Now, as we go through, you'll see there's certain defaults that have been selected, and you can do different things if you go ahead and run runners as a private self-hosted affair. If you are on GitLab.com, you can also still do private self-hosted runners. So the first one we'll cover is the default Windows Shell Runner. We recently added Windows Shell Runners as an option in GitLab. You have to tag your jobs appropriately, and then they'll be directed towards those shared runners. So when you get on those shared runners, you have elevated admin permissions, and this would be concerning except that every time you ask for a Windows machine, a brand new VM is spun up, you get access to it, and then it's destroyed. And of course, this is really important in CI because you may need to install a lot of tools and utilities, and the inability to have admin rights would prevent you from doing that. So these are ephemeral machines, so you're able to have admin rights. And then Windows PowerShell is installed on there by default. Now, when Windows Shell Runner or any type of Windows Runner is your default runner, PowerShell is also your default shell. So you don't have to worry about starting up in CMD and then having to uh, shell over to PowerShell. If you want to, you can install PowerShell 7 or PowerShell Core, and then you can call it from the default PowerShell. So that's something that's still possible if you need to add that to the uh, mix. Um, if you want to see PowerShell 7 already pre-installed in these machines, by all means, go out to GitLab and put in a new issue and say, uh, on the runner repo specifically, uh, say that you'd like to see the PowerShell core uh, PowerShell 7 runtimes pre-installed. Otherwise, we're going to show you how to dynamically pre-install those. Now, one of the things you'll also see when we go through is that when your default shell is known by GitLab Runner, it populates, in the case of PowerShell, all of its CI variables into both environment variables and into regular PowerShell variables. Now, when you call another shell, such as calling PowerShell core from PowerShell, or if you call any other third-party shell, the infusion of those variables as regular variables does not happen. So consequently, only environment variables are exposed as far as all the GitLab CI information. So it might be a good practice to get in the, the habit of always using environment variables, and then you won't have to worry about whether or not the shell you're using is default or not. The next runner we'll talk about is the Docker executor, which is the default runner on GitLab. And one of the reasons why you might consider this for PowerShell is in the case of all clouds, it's cheaper to run under Linux than it is under Windows. And so because of this, uh, you're able to take advantage of that cheaper compute for your PowerShell. Now, obviously you have to have PowerShell that doesn't have any dependencies on Windows and uh, that would include file system references. So as long as your PowerShell is cleaned up a little bit and it's just you're basically using the logic of PowerShell to say run um, AWS CLI or something like that, then it's entirely doable that you could potentially port over to Linux. Now this first example, um, all the Docker daemons on uh, GitLab uh, have Docker privileged mode and this is so that you can build containers when you're um, doing uh, Docker builds, uh, Docker and Docker builds. Um, and then in this case, we're going to show you taking Microsoft's .NET Core 3.1 container, which is Linux, and has PowerShell 7 pre-installed. So in that case, you just grab that container, you're good to go with PowerShell. It doesn't become your default shell because in the Docker executor for Linux, we're always assuming that Bash is your default shell. And because this is a Linux container, you do end up in Bash initially, but you can shell over and use PowerShell. Then the final uh, approach that we'll take a look at is using any Linux and runtime installing PowerShell. So we have the same things that are true about the base uh, Docker executor. And then on top of that, we'll grab Amazon Linux because we know that it's compatible with the PowerShell installer and then runtime install PowerShell core. Uh, and then we have the same environment. So these are several different ways that you can kind of uh, slice this. 
Now, one other thing we're going to demonstrate across these is, first of all, we're going to have a repository-based script that you can call, and we're also going to show you calling a script within the YAML. So two popular approaches to actually your actual build scripts. But we're also going to show you that the repository-based script we have is not dispositioned towards Windows, so it can actually be called in all of these scenarios. And then finally, we're also going to show that an artifact generated in the first stage can easily be passed between all of these stages. So within GitLab, you have the concept of a pipeline, and inside of a pipeline is a job. Within the jobs, you can specify what runner to use, and if you're using a Docker runner, you can specify what image to use. So this makes it possible to have all of these combinations in one pipeline. Now, in reality, you aren't going to be very likely to have to combine all of these things into one pipeline, but you should be aware of this. Um, especially if you're coming from a Windows background, you might be able to use some really cool tools and utilities that are on Linux only. We have some examples in a, a subsection of GitLab called Guided Explorations using uh, file templating. So you take a bunch of variables, you grab a file, and you substitute those variables into the file. Well, in a Windows workflow, you could still use the Linux utilities for doing this kind of thing when they're self-contained in a container and a GitLab job. Keep in mind that we're going to be showing all PowerShell, but you could kind of mix and match your pipelines in this way across, uh, in, at all times across whatever utilities and tooling that you need to use. So let's dive into the code next. We're in a section of GitLab.com called Guided-Explorations. And this section actually is comprised of a lot of working examples of how to use GitLab. And these examples are provided in a working format precisely so that it eases your learning. You can see the code, see how it works, see the CI logs, and you can also grab a copy and put it in your own group or in your own, own instance and use it as a starting point for either your learning or production projects. So we're going to dig down here on the PowerShell section. And we have PowerShell pipelines on GitLab CI. Now within here, each one of these guided explorations has a readme document that tells you a lot of details about the whole uh, guided exploration. It tells you who owns it. It tells you what kind of features of GitLab and or general development patterns that it shows and demonstrates. It also might give notes on how to use this specific one. And if also if there's additional setup steps, like maybe some CI CD variables, you should find those in here as well. Now we'll dig right into the code. So we're going to go into our GitLab CI YAML, and we'll analyze it. We have um, several different stages here and, uh, and about five jobs, I think, that we'll go through and talk about. So this first one is going to run on a shared GitLab Windows runner. And they, they are shell runners. And the way that we make sure that it runs on those runners is that we uh, use these three tags here. And this will ensure that this runs on a shared Windows runner on GitLab.com. You can also see that we're setting a variable here, and this just helps you understand that variables set in the pipeline are transferred into script code. And then we can see here in our script that we start working on executing individual script that we're working with. Right at the very beginning, we have this test. And so I wanted to display for you that when you run on Git, uh, GitLab.com shared runners, you have admin rights. And the reason you have admin rights is you might need to install a lot of development utilities. And because every time you start a job on GitLab.com, it's a brand new fresh VM, gets thrown away and a new one created each time you run a job, kind of like a container, it's safe to give you admin rights. So we can see here that we have uh, some calls, but these happen to be Windows specific. So they're .NET uh, calls, but they're specific to Windows. So we're using this test right here in order to ensure that uh, we are on Windows. And so the first part of the test says, is a variable, is Windows missing? Because a Windows PowerShell, the variable is Windows is not there. And then the next one says, is, is Windows uh, true? So on PowerShell core running on Windows, is Windows will be true. It's important to understand about PowerShell, if you haven't used it a lot, that when it's doing tests like this, as soon as it hits a failed test, it stops the tests. So a lot of languages continue on through the rest of the tests and the things that they're checking have to exist. But in this case, if the variable doesn't exist, we fail the test and we don't go on further to check the value of the, of the actual variable. So this kind of test works on PowerShell. So if we are in Windows, we're going to go check if you're admin and put that on the screen. And then we also do a couple other things. We list all the PowerShell variables. And then we also list uh, all of the environment variables. And the reason this is important is that when Windows is the default um, host, then PowerShell becomes the default shell. 
and it makes the GitLab variables available as both shell variables and environment variables. But when Windows PowerShell is not the default version and you're using PowerShell core, then it only receives them as environment variables. Then we collect this artifact uh, that we created. It's just simply a text file with a bit of text in it. And we're gonna pass that artifact down through the stages as we go. So you can see that not only can we intermix the platforms and the versions of PowerShell in the pipeline, we can also pass artifacts between them. And of course, the ability to pass artifacts uh, is not required. You're not necessarily gonna be using different versions of PowerShell in your pipeline, but I wanted to make sure that you understood whether it's Windows or Linux or PowerShell or something else, you can mix and match your stages. Uh, we have a few plugins that are built on Linux containers, and uh, you could technically use them in a Windows uh, environment. So one of them just templates files, takes environment variables out of your job, and sticks them into a templated uh, file format so that those variables translate into, say, uh, uh, Java properties file. Well, you could well, even if you're using Windows uh, as your primary uh, build environment, you could technically use that Linux phase to build out any file templating you needed. So we're going to take a look at how this first job processed. So this is our pipeline. And I'm going to go back up to the top of the log. And we can see that it tells us that um, we are running admin and that admin's OK because we toss this container or we toss this virtual machine every time. We do a PS version table. So you can see that we're on PowerShell 5.1. And then we put, print out all of our PowerShell variables and later all of our environment variables. So you're able to see the differences and see when they're the same. And then at the very end, we uh, upload that artifact file that we had created so that we get uh, it collected as an artifact. So that's the first job. So you can see that on a shell runner, running Windows PowerShell on the default shared runners uh, works just fine. If you were to set up GitLab as a self-hosted private runner, then you would be able to do the same thing with the shell runner. Uh, it's also important to realize that on even if you're using gitlab.com SAS to store your source code and do all of your activities for development, you can have your own self-hosted uh, runners in your own environment. Uh, so sometimes folks don't understand that um, even when you're even using GitLab hosted, you can do self-hosting on the runners to do things like put them in secure environments and other things like that. So all the stuff we're covering here, while I'm covering what goes on in gitlob.com, you could actually build your own runner and change some of these things, such as the CI user not having uh, admin permissions or uh, what version of PowerShell you, uh, is on the system uh, already instead of having to dynamically install it. So let's take a look at our next job here. This one does the same exact thing, except instead of calling uh, inline script code, it calls a script other repository. So some of you will want to build your build scripts right into the, the YAML. Others will want to have them stand alone in the repository. And this is just demonstrating to you how that would occur. And we're gonna pick up repository-based script here. You can see here it's telling us we got admin rights. Here's our version information and our PowerShell variables, as well as our environment variables. So same basic layout. Uh, so we're now going to shift to a YAML embedded script on a Linux host with PowerShell pre-installed. And so this is Microsoft's actual .NET Core SDK. And if you use 3.1 or later of the SDK, it has PowerShell pre-installed. Uh, be careful that the 2x ones do not have PowerShell pre-installed. So this sample won't work with the 2.x uh, 2. Uh, 2. containers. So we have the same basic layout. Uh, what we do though is show you that you have to call PowerShell Core because it's not the default shell uh, even on this particular container. And then we call our embedded script. So you can see that we can, how, we, how you would call code that is uh, inline as well as embedded when you're using a non-default PowerShell Core. And we also then output the uh, results of the artifact file. So you can see that that is indeed moving between uh, stages. And I think I didn't show you that result uh, earlier, but uh, here in this one, it says this artifact was built on PowerShell for Windows in a job named, and it gives the job name. So if we go up to the top here, we will see that the if statement is now saying, hey, you're not running on Windows, so I'm not gonna try to see if you have admin. And then we can also see that in the regular shell variables, we do not have our GitLab CI 
uh, variables. So we would need to use them as environment variables, and you can see down here as environment variables, we can indeed see that they're coming through. And then finally, this final stage, we are taking a different Linux, so the Linux of our choice. I picked Amazon Linux simply because uh, I built this um, installer uh, for PowerShell core to go on Amazon Linux, so wanted to play with it just as a kind of a uh, out-of-the-box example. And so you can see here we are simply um, bringing down the install script from the PowerShell repository and then running it. And then once that's done, we do the same as we did in the job above. Let's take a look at what that looks like. Uh, so everything's basically the same, except now we see this PowerShell uh, core install happen. So you can see that uh, the PowerShell core install is queued up, completed using yum. And then once PowerShell is installed, we can call it immediately. Uh, you can see that we only have our CI variables. Oh, I should have just shown this real quick. Uh, you can see that we're on PowerShell version 7 and what version of .NET is backing it and what OS we're on. And then as we proceed down here, um, you can see all the variables. And then finally, you can see that artifact output. So that is an example of a lot of different ways to uh, run PowerShell on GitLab CI and even some uh, magic of passing uh, information and artifacts in between. So let's uh, do a quick wrap up and then we'll be done. So I hope walking through that guided exploration helps you understand how to leverage PowerShell under GitLab CI. It can be really frustrating to have to knit together bits and pieces of sample code in an unfamiliar framework. It can take a lot of weeks or days to get things done. So we hope that Guided Explorations helps you over the learning curve. The actual URL for the Guided Exploration for PowerShell is right there on the screen in case you need to reference that. And I really love my job at GitLab as a solutions architect. I get to dig in with customers into some of the challenges they're having and help them overcome those challenges as they're looking at how to use our DevOps tooling to accelerate their efforts. So if you'd like to get in contact with GitLab sales, you might also be able to get a, a solutions architect to look at your challenges. The entry point to all of that is our sales URL there on the screen. If you're having trouble with PowerShell working under GitLab CI, feel free to give me a shout out on social. I'll give you a hand with whatever I can in order to make that journey easier for you. Thanks a lot for your time and attention. I hope this content has been helpful to you.